short-term rentals have seen a huge decline in the current market, which leaves people with Airbnbs left wondering what they can do with their portfolio. Mid-term rentals have now entered the scene. Hi, I'm Amanda Hahn, CPA and tax strategist, and also author of the Bigger Pockets book, Tax Strategies for the Savvy Real Estate Investor. Today, Ziona McIntyre and I will be discussing midterm rentals and why you should think about scaling your portfolio to midterm rentals, and also what tax strategies you can use to save thousands of dollars. Ziona, hi, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. This should be so fun. Awesome. Well, tell, first, tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of your journey into midterm rentals. Yeah, so I am the co-author of 30 Day Stay, so that's a Bigger Pockets book as well, all about medium-term rentals. And I've been a short and medium-term investor since 2012, so I got into it a long time ago and have really seen all the transitions of the market. So I agree with you, things have changed a lot and they're not doing as well in the short-term space. So it is important that people have more tools in their toolbox. So let's talk about midterm rentals. Yeah, I think maybe we can start with defining what exactly is is a midterm rental. But first, meet my friend Dave. Dave literally wrote the book on real estate note investing for Bigger Pockets, and his company, PPR Capital Management, wants you to be part of the real estate investment fund. No tenants, maintenance, or property managers, just headache free cash flow. Dave and his team at PPR invest in mortgage notes and commercial real estate nationwide. And since 2007, Dave's team has never missed a passive monthly income payment. Looking for cash flow? Accredited investors can get started at investwithppr.com. That's investwithppr.com. All right, let's get back to the show. We all know like long-term rentals where we just have a tenant that they're in there forever or hopefully forever. And then we have the short-term rentals, which are like all the Airbnb and Verbo. But like what exactly is a midterm rental? Yeah, so short term is anything under 30 days furnished. And then midterm or medium term is going to be 30 days plus. So you tend to see about three month stays as the average because that's when travel nurses get assigned. And so yeah, anything from three months to a year is that midterm space. In your experience, and also just like with your own properties, are traveling nurses kind of do they make up the bulk of who our tenants are in the midterm rental space? Or are there others? It really depends on where you're located. If you're in Cleveland, yeah, Cleveland Clinic is part of the kind of lifeblood of that city. So yes, but where I have some rentals in Boulder, Colorado, we have a lot more tech here and scientists that are coming in for different studies. So I tend to see more students, tech, um, it can really vary. So there's a whole range of tenant possibilities. In the tax space, in the last couple of years, we've been talking a lot about the short-term rental loophole. Uh, and that's where like, you know, even if you have a full time job, if you're doing short term rentals on the side and you're spending enough hours managing them and dealing with the properties that you can actually use those losses to offset W-2 income. So inevitably, you know, as sexy as that strategy is, oftentimes we, we have clients who after they do that for a year, they kind of get tired of it and they're like, hey, you know, I got all the tax benefits, but I really don't want to deal with all the, you know, short term turnovers. And from what I see, at least, that's a really great opportunity to say, well, maybe in the second or in the third year, you can turn them into midterm rentals. You know, what you're sharing is, hey, a lot less headache. And I've come across investors who come to us saying, hey, I really want to use the short term rental loophole because, you know, I, I just feel like it's easier for me to do it. But in terms of like the county, I'm not able to get the license or the permit because they don't allow short term rental operators. But, you know, like you're saying, it's, it's, it's really just maybe like a small shift to say, well, instead of doing 30 days or less, I'm going to do 30 days or more. And now I have a, a, you know, a midterm rental and still be able to get the higher cash flow. But you know, a question that I get a lot is, well, if I invest in the midterm rental, can I still use the short term rental loophole? Unfortunately, the answer is, is, is typically no, because a short term rental, you know, like you just defined Ziona is a property where the average guest to stay is seven days or less. And just by definition, if we're calling a property midterm, usually it means it's 30 days or longer, right? So, so those two can't also be facts. Now, if I have a property that's maybe, um, a short term rental for, 11 months out of the year and I turn it into a midterm rental at the very end, we could probably still work the average days out to be less than seven. But, you know, if our intention is to really operate a midterm rental, then I think it's important for investors to say, okay, well, then how can I use midterm rentals as a tax strategy uh, instead? I know you invest, you know, like you say, you know, short term and, and midterm space as well. What are some tax strategies that you've really liked utilizing with respect to, to your portfolio? 
Yeah, so I'm a realtor, and that means that I qualify for rep strat status, not only because I'm a realtor, but because I am full-time and I have a bunch of rentals, I get enough hours to qualify, and you might want to go over what that is. But for me, it's good to have both midterms, which are seen as long-term rentals for the IRS, and also to have the short-term rentals. So I am a big fan of that idea of buying something, maybe even towards the end of the year, self-managing it as a short-term rental for a little while, and and then turning it into a midterm rental because of the regulations, because you can still cash flow a decent amount, and also because if you're in an urban space, an urban environment, you've got more tenants all year round and you have a lot less seasonality, which hurts people often in that short term rental space. For our audience who doesn't know, if you're someone who invests in long term rentals or even most midterm rentals and you have higher income, and higher income is defined as those with 150,000 or more of income, you have to be a real estate professional if you want to use your rental losses to offset taxes from a W-2 job or a non-real estate business. And so that's why it's a lot more difficult, you know, if you're not a realtor or if you don't already own a portfolio of rental properties to be a real estate professional. To be a real estate professional, there are three roles to meet, essentially. The first is that you have to spend more time in real estate than your job. So for someone like you, Ziona, real estate is your job. So you've already met that first role. It's my life. <laughs> you're already there. Uh, the second rule is you have to spend at least 750 hours. So if you're someone like Ziona, let's say she kind of got lazy one day, didn't want to work as much. Well, she still has to spend at least 750 hours in real estate. Otherwise, even having a license won't help you out. Um, and then the third rule is you have to meet material participation in your rental properties. Several different ways to meet it, but you know, more than the most common ones with long-term and midterm rentals is spending at least 500 hours on the properties that you actually own. So the benefit is as soon as you meet all three of those rules, then you can be really creative to use a lot of depreciation and tax benefits to offset taxes, not just from the rental income, but also from your business or other W-2 income as well. I wanted to shift gears a little bit. Um, Ziona, maybe you can share with me. I think one of the questions that I get all the time is like, you know, do I need to have a legal entity for my midterm rentals? How should I structure it? So I'm just curious, um, kind of like how you approach your entity structuring, knowing that you own a lot of different properties and different types of properties. You know, my tax strategist, he wants me to move everything into LLCs, but I will preface that I have been investing in real estate for 11 or 12 years, and all of my properties are actually currently in my name. I have an umbrella policy, so it covers me for liability, and I understand that this might not be the best strategy for now, but what I wanna tell people is don't let the fact that you don't know the perfect entity and the perfect strategy to keep you from investing. Because if I would have, I'd still be here with no income and no properties, but I've been able to build something really great to take care of my future because I just started and I just took that first step. And now I've got a lot more resources and people to support me with better decisions. So I think I will be changing the structure, but currently an umbrella policy is a great second option. And then clearly I think you mentioned earlier, you are getting a lot of the tax benefits, right, of investing in real estate, like write offs and depreciation and all that stuff. Yeah, and I would say one of the biggest mistakes I made at the beginning is not using a real estate focused CPA. So at first I, you know, just did TurboTax and that was the best that I could do at that time. But as I've gotten um, a little more educated and I got a bookkeeper, I had a CPA that was just a regular CPA and didn't know about real estate taxes. So I think it's really important that if this is something that is the focus of what your work is, that you do find someone who really understands. Because when I switched from someone who didn't know to someone who did focus on real estate. It went from, oh, you owe $50,000 to, oh, you shouldn't have paid that $50,000 last year and you don't need to pay taxes for the next two or three years based on everything you have. So I think there's a really big difference out there. Yeah, I think it's probably one of the more common tax mistake that we see investors make, you know, starting out, they don't, you don't really know 
that there's a huge difference. And so it's like, oh, I've been with my CPA for for years, right? Just continue using them because they've done some kind of real estate. And especially as your portfolio grows, it could get a lot more complicated. So definitely a really important person um, to have on your team. But I love that you said that you, that, you know, you kind of don't really have this, the, the entity structuring just yet, but for you is really important to take action. Um, and I think that's absolutely key because we meet investors all the time, uh, who come to us and say, Hey, I have this entity form that owns this other entity and this entity over here that's going to get money from this entity. And then my question always is, okay, well, tell me about your real estate. Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, the answer is I don't own any real estate, but I have all the entities ready for my real estate. And so you just, you know, always want to start with like the business activity itself. It's so much more important to just get started in the transaction rather than to be worrying about, you know, what my entity is going to be and, you know, what I'm going to call it. You know, believe it or not, people are so stuck on like waiting for the ideal entity name and then really not pulling the trigger on buying a property for months on end. Um, so uh, especially for, you know, newer investors who are with us, regardless of whether you have an entity or not, you know, all the tax deductions that you get as an investor, you know, whether it's claiming a home office or claiming the business use of your car, right? You're driving to look at properties or going to a meetup to, you know, computers or cell phone that you're using. All those common deductions are available to you regardless of whether you have a legal entity or not. I think a question that I get a lot from investors who, you know, maybe their long term is not performing as well or their short terms aren't performing as well, you know, is whether it makes sense to turn a specific property into a midterm rental. What markets do you typically invest in terms of midterm? I'm in a bunch of different markets and I actually don't recommend that. So the way that kind of happened for me is that I've been doing it for so long that it was sort of like, oh, I heard this market's cool. This is an up and coming, you know, and everybody wants to find that new gem that's going to make a million dollars. So I did chase a lot of things and I've kept a lot of these properties, but what I've learned in doing midterm rentals for a while now is that you're going to be more successful if you have multiple properties in that same area. And the reason is that maybe a recruiter is going to reach out to you and maybe they'll have more tenants once they've built up a really good relationship with you. Um, that could also be true for an insurance company that's needing to place people that are displaced from a fire or something like that. If they've worked with you once and it's been a good experience, they may come back more and more. In fact, it's actually something we talk to our clients about too as well uh, from a planning perspective. I mean, one, like you mentioned, it's a lot more scalable, right? You've already created your system on the ground in this market. And so I'm going to leverage all that to, to grow rather than going to another market. And I have to create the systems again, create my teams again. But, you know, speaking as a, a CPA and as a tax strategist, it is a lot more burdensome in terms of paperwork and tax filings when you diversify into different markets as well. So I have one rental uh, in Ohio. Now I'm going to have to file Ohio tax return. I now have another rental in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Here we go with Pennsylvania tax return filings. And so, you know, it's also important when you're looking at different markets to try to uh, limit those, at least, you know, even from a, from a state perspective. So you don't end up with three rentals and filing a tax return. That's a thousand pages because you have a property in, in, you know, only one property in each of those. So I don't want to get too personal, Ziona, but of course I'm a CPA. So I am going to have to ask you questions about the dreadful T word of taxes. You know, we all know that being a real estate investor comes with some really amazing tax benefits. Nonetheless, uh, tax time, I think, is always uh, stressful for people. You and I were uh, together in person, actually, during the last tax deadline. So tell me, what kind of is your process? How do you feel about tax time? What's your process in terms of getting yourself prepared uh, going into tax season? Yeah, I mean, to be perfectly honest, taxes are not my favorite thing. And I think it's because I was not as organized as I'm becoming now. And this last year, I had a bookkeeper that didn't really work out. And so towards the end of the year, we were kind of in crunch time to get everything fixed. And I was also using a newer CPA. But going into this next year, I've got a great new bookkeeper and we are like going over the books every single month month. And so I think it's going to be super easy. I think I might actually file in April, which is crazy. I've always been a very, very late filer. So yeah, I think really it's just having those numbers together and just being on top of it throughout the year. 
You know, I'm tracking my miles and I'm not waiting until too much time goes by. It's like all of those little things, tracking your reps, just so you know that you've got enough hours. If you wait till the end of the year, it's just a burden to kind of go back and say, did I do enough? So trying to keep on it throughout the year. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting that you mentioned, um, you know, tax time being a, a stress and you brought, I think the first thing you brought up was the bookkeeping. I think there's so much truth to that. Uh, people actually don't, dread tax season, but they dread getting everything together. And for most people, it's the bookkeeping side. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't have all my records straight. And now I have to go back, you know, 12 months ago and try to figure out what I did. And so in terms of, you know, getting a bookkeeper and doing it continuously throughout the year, you know, month by month, or even every week or every other week is so important. Because if you're like me, I hardly remember what I did two weeks ago. So to have to go back to two months ago or 12 months ago, um, I think that's where people find the stress. And, you know, having good bookkeeping is, is more than just about, you know, knowing the numbers. It, you know, allows you to capture all of your expenses, right? And we can only claim expenses to the extent that we remember them and we can capture them outside of taxes. I mean, we need to know our numbers on a month to month basis to be a good landlord, right? So we can make faster decisions on, you know, should I keep this as a midterm rental? Is it working out? Should it be a short term rental? So thank you so much for sharing all that with us. And thank you so much for all your time here today. Ziona, where can people find you? My website, zionamcintyre.com. Instagram is the place that I'm the most active. So check me out there, Ziona McIntyre. And you said you're um, also licensed as a realtor. So do you also help people just buy and sell houses or is it only for um, buying and selling for yourself? No, I help people in the state of Colorado. I'm licensed, but I also do wholesaling all over the U.S. So I help a lot of people that are high income earners looking for cost segregation benefits through short term rentals. So that's kind of my bread and butter with creative financing. So, yeah, reach out. Ooh, awesome. You said the key word, creative financing. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I am Amanda Hahn. If you want additional tax strategies, you can visit my firm at keystonecpa.com or you can follow me on social media. I am mostly found on Instagram as Amanda Hahn CPA. So check me out there if you're looking for daily tax tips. And if you found this video helpful, like and subscribe to the Bigger Pockets channel for more videos just like this or go to biggerpockets.com to check out all the amazing tools that they have for new investors. And if you have questions or comments, drop them in the comments below. Have a good one.